Welcome back. So we are now going to cover uh, lecture six and we'll discuss about the pressure of, uh, of a gas. In fact, we will look into uh, the ideal gas and we will, in reality, we will derive the uh, ideal uh, gas law that was presented as being uh, empirically obtained, which historically is the, is the case. And uh, today we'll see that using Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution that we've seen in a previous screencast, uh, we can actually derive the ideal gas law. And that's also the advantage of this is that it will help us understand the, the approximation we make in the ideal gas law. Uh, so let's formalize this uh, completely from a, from, from a mathematical standpoint. We will also discuss the connection between pressure and kinetic energy density. So we talk a lot about density, it's always about per unit volume uh, usually, uh, which is of course something that, uh, th that's, that's important in terms of, of scaling law and so on and so forth. So today we will do uh, pressure. I I'd like to remind uh, whoever is uh, uh, watching and listening to, to this screencast, that these screencasts are companions to the book from Blundell and Blundell, which is, uh, which was, which is the reference is given in, in, this, uh, in the playlist of this YouTube channel. Uh, so this is not um, a substitute for, for the book, it's, it's a companion to the book uh, and uh, try to insist on the most important point. But if there is anything that's unclear, I invite you to go back to the book, uh, which is probably going to, probably going to give you uh, additional information. Uh, the mathematical derivations that I make here are, are close to what's written in the book, even though I try to bring a few... Uh, uh, maybe a, a few additional comment or, or, or some kind of intuition for some parts that, uh, that are different, slightly different from the book, but of course, totally compatible. Okay, let's, let's move on with this. Uh, we are going to talk about pressure. So just a, a, a very elementary uh, reminder of what pressure is. A pressure is essentially uh, a force per, per unit area. Uh, the, the actual, uh, Definition is really the force, the, the, the perpendicular component of the force. As you know, a physicist, what, what, what uh, the difference between a physicist and a non physicist is that the physicist knows that forces and velocity and so on are, are, are vectors. So here we are talking about, of course, I'm, I'm being facetious here, but the point is um, the point remains that for pressure, what matters is the component that's perpendicular to the surface. And we will see uh, that we will exploit that fact uh, in the derivation in the next slides. So it's essentially the point is that pressure is the ratio of the perpendicular contact force to the area of contact. Uh, we know that the unit for force uh, is, uh, is Newton. And, uh, and of course the unit for surface area is square meter in the SI unit. And of course uh, the ratio between Newton and uh, square meter is the Pascal, it's the, the unit for pressure. And of course, uh, as I already mentioned, what we have to worry about is the component that's perpendicular to the surface area. Okay, so for example, this is something we'll go, come back to in, a, uh, in the future. Uh, we can use that information to see that there is a, a direct connection between the force and the pressure. And you know, if you, if you watch the, the weather channel, uh, you know, we talk about, about uh, pressure and the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is really the pressure due to the force uh, of the air that's above a given surface area on Earth. So uh, somebody tells you that the air has, a, has an average density of about 129 kilograms per, per square cube, uh, per, per square meter cube, uh, per, per cube meter, uh, we get, uh, we can actually um, calculate the height. Why? Because the force, as you know, the gravitational force close to, to the Earth, it can be uh, approximated as uh, as uh, mgh, right? So with uh, uh, where h is uh, the height of um, where uh, is the height of of the of, of the atmosphere. Uh, of course, here we're going to talk about density, right? So we replace the mass by uh, by density, so the mass divided by the by the volume, and so we can actually look at the uh, at the height uh, by basically having a 
translation from pressure into height. And so what we find is that if we know that uh, the, the, the pressure is, is 10 to the power of 5 uh, Pascal, which is about, about the case uh, unless there is a storm or, or something like this, it's just typical pressure, uh, we find that the height of uh, the atmosphere is about 10,000 meters. Uh, and um, this is actually fairly accurate. Um, and it is the order of magnitude is accurate. Uh, of course, we have to realize this is a, this is a big uh, simplification because the density of the atmosphere is by no means uh, uh, constant, of course, as you know that. Uh, for people who do uh, climbing, they know that uh, the density of, of air changes with height very quickly. Okay, so uh, let's go to the to, to really the most important piece of this screencast. And uh, before we do that, uh, let me remind you of a very important thing, which is called the equation of state. So, you know, a system is going to, can be described by a number of variables. Let's, for example, temperature, pressure, volume, uh, number of, of atoms, or number of particles. Uh, and uh, typically those variables are connected to one another. So they are not all independent. And the connection between them um, is called an equation of state. So that would be in, in a formal way. For example, we can say that the pressure depends on the temperature, volume, and number of particles. And so we will say that pressure is a function of those variables. And uh, what we need to know is what is that function, of course. And we've already uh, seen one in this course. And uh, the one we've seen is uh, the ideal gas equation. So it's an equation that applies to ideal gas. And uh, remember, PV equal to nKBT, where n is the number of molecules. Um, <clears throat> um, we, we see that this is, this is a relationship that works in this case uh, in, for the ideal gas. Okay, so this is this is very important because, of course, uh, you should not have to um, measure or determine all the variables since some are related to one another. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to let's let's do this. Uh, we are going to talk. This is really the the fundamentals of the kinetic theory of gas, and uh, this is something that was suggested uh, more than three hundred about three hundred years ago by, by uh, Daniel Bernoulli. Uh, attempted to explain the Bohr's law. And you have to realize back uh, 300 years ago, uh, there was no such thing. People did not understand the atoms, molecules, and so on and so forth. So a gas was definitely not understood as a, as a number of tiny particles. So when people were suggesting that the pressure in a container uh, was related to tiny elements like molecules hitting walls, it was not a very popular idea. Uh, of course, this is this is how science works. We we start with things that are not very popular, and then uh, theory shows uh, we have a new theory that turned out to to represent experiments very well, and so that be part of the new theory. And this is this is one of those examples uh, for the kinetic theory of gas. So back then, three hundred years ago, there was no uh, understanding of how the, the of the connection between molecules in a, in a container and the pressure, and so. Uh, it turns out that that's what Daniel Bernoulli suggested here, is that uh, we can explain uh, pr uh, properties like pressure from the kinetic theory of gas. So that's what that's what we are going to do. So now, what's nice about this is that in the previous screencast we uh, proved um, um, we, we actually studied the what's called the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation, which gives us the probability of finding a particular a gas molecule in, at a given uh, speed. So we already have done the hardest part of the job here because we we already know the distribution of particles as a function of their of their velocity, and so we are going to use this uh, directly in our in in our proof. So let's let's try to see what we are trying to do here. We are trying to calculate uh, the pressure, and uh, let let's try to to one step one step at a time. So we know the pressure is a force per unit area. Again, force, the, the normal, normal uh, um, component of the force per unit area. Uh, we also know the force, of course, is a change in momentum with time, right? So the perpendicular component of the force 
uh, which you probably show as a subscript in, in this equation on this slide, uh, is related to the variation on of the momentum perpendicular to the to, to, to the to the to the wall to the surface, and of course this in, the, the momentum uh, the change in momentum is like an impulse, which of course can be related to pressure. That's what we're going to do. So what we really need to do is to calculate the total impulse on the surface area per unit time, right? That's what when we do a derivative function of time, we are looking at this change dmv uh, perpendicular for a given small time. So um, the first question we need to, uh, to, to answer is the number of particles that have speed v, okay, v, v perpendicular. Uh, and then we will, um, we will move from there and uh, try to see how many of them there are and how much uh, momentum they have, okay? Uh, so nothing is really complicated here. What's complicated is that there are many different steps and each steps, uh, aside from one step, which I'll spend a bit more time on, most of the steps are, are fairly elementary. Uh, is just have to keep track of, of what we're doing. So it's, it's, it's really a, a bookkeeping exercise, okay? So let's try first to see, so you see, just to, rem to remind you, what we are trying to do here is to find the total change in momentum uh, that we can expect uh, for a given time, for a given amount of time on a certain unit surface area. And if we do that, we'll get an idea of what the pressure is. Good. The first thing we need to remember, of course, is the distribution of velocity. Uh, and this slide is essentially a reminder of, uh, the, re of, the, of the screencast on Boltzmann, on Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. So the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation is, is repeated there on the top on the top of this of this screen um, and uh, we'll call it f of v and remember f v dv is the uh, probability distribution of finding a particle of with uh, uh, speed between speed v and v plus dv okay this is this is the Boltzmann Maxwell Boltzmann equation good now this is for one particle and if we have a, a if we have a density of particle, which we will denote lowercase n, so a density of particle means the total number of particles divided by the volume. Of course, no, uh, uh, the expectation is that the total, the, the number of particles that have velocity between v and v plus dv will be n times f uh, v dv. Okay, so this is already a good thing. We already know the number of particles that will have a velocity between v and v plus dv, and those will be. Uh, will be n f v d v. Good. This is the first point. Now there is a little bit of a problem here, is that um, if I go back to the previous slide, and uh, if you look at the at this, at this at the little schematic I put on the right hand side, we understand that the velocity vector is given by the little vector with an arrow at the end, and uh, we want the the projection of that vector on the normal, which is denoted by the uh, red dot lines, the red dotted line. Now, the problem is, this is the typical example we, we usually use because uh, uh, the paper we use usually is too, usually two dimensional. But here you have to realize that we are working in 3D. So what we need to consider here, if we talk about an angle theta, we're not just talking about theta, theta in two dimension, which is fairly easy here, it's gonna be, uh, it's, it's, it's easier in 2D, but in 3D, when we, when we mention an angle, uh, uh, an angle uh, with respect to the perpendicular to be theta, we really mean a number of vectors that, are, that belong to a cone, okay? So uh, this is, this is uh, why uh, students are usually stuck because they don't like uh, integrating in 3D. But uh, this is the idea of the solid angle. So I'm, I'm going to try to explain that to you here. So if we talk about uh, a vector that has, that has an opening theta with respect to a given, uh, given direction, in 2D it's fairly easy and, and we do this by, by calculating theta, which is simply uh, by definition the ratio between the arc that's opened by the angle theta, which is the arc length is S, and the radius, okay? So this is the, this is the idea. Now in 3D we have to consider uh, not so much a circle uh, uh, or, or a disk, but instead we have to consider a sphere. And the angle that matters now 
is the angle it corresponds to a cone of opening uh, of the opening uh, omega, and the omega <clears throat> is essentially the angle uh, that's going to to describe this ratio again, just the same way as two D. The ratio between the surface area A and R square. Uh, so you can understand why we use R square because we want the uppercase omega to be unitless. So we need to divide a surface by a surface. But this is an expansion from the 2D to the, to the 3D. So one way to think about it is that you suppose that you are looking ahead of you and then you take a cone, just like think about those, those, uh, those dogs and cats who need to use a cone to avoid, to, to, to make it impossible for them to, 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 to lick their wound or something like that. So basically those dogs and cats uh, are essentially, in, they've, they've been given a solid angle they can, they can look at. So they have a solid angle. This is the idea. So they have basically the idea is that they focus on a surface, on a cer certain opening that's available to them. So this is exactly the same idea here. And the idea, of course, is that you have a, a certain opening that's available to you. Now, one thing that you have to realize, of course, is that if we if we consider the surface, if we consider the, the, the solid angle that opens the entire sphere, which is possible, of course, that means that uh, we we would like that number. Um, I mean, we can calculate that number because the surface area of a sphere is, of course, four pi r square, and that means that the solid angle that corresponds to the entire sphere will be four pi four pi r square divided by r square, which is, of course, four pi. So this is a very important thing to remember: uh, is that the total, uh, the, the largest, uh, the maximum uh, solid angle is four pi. So that's very important because when we will use when we look at smaller um, solid angle, we'll see we will be able to see a ratio of that piece of the sphere with respect to the entire sphere. We'll we'll see that in a second. Okay. So uh, with this in mind, and uh, it's important for you to to re understand this this notion of solid angle that comes, of course, in in different area of physics. It's always important to try to develop an intuition about this. Okay. So let's do this. And now remember that uh, we are going to be to we know already how many uh, molecules or particles, uh, molecules of gas, are traveling as at the given speed. Right? We just calculated that two slides ago using the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. Now we know that uh, not every particle will uh, will transfer the same amount of momentum to to a wall. Right? Uh, because we know that the momentum will depend on the projection of the velocity vector along the normal. So what we are going to do here in this, in this derivation is consider all those velocity that are going to, that have the same component along the normal. So basically what we are going to do, we are going to look at all, we're going to consider each, part, each set of particles that uh, that have an angle uh, with respect to the to the direction to the normal of the surface that have a given angle theta okay and so why do we do that because we know that all those particles that have a certain angle theta or between theta and theta plus d theta for for continuous distribution we know that all of those will have the same uh, projection on the normal and then after that once we have all that we know what they what kind of momentum they transfer and then we'll integrate over all the theta. That's what we are going to do here. So we are going to go to the to the solid angle, and uh, what we are the, this, what we are going to be interested in here is a given uh, angle theta. So think a, a bit again uh, again about this this idea of uh, of the cone I was telling you about. Well, you just have to consider the you do not consider the entire cone, but instead you you dis, you you have to follow the, the the rim of the cone, if you will. So so all the particles that go to a certain angle are going to be the ones who are on the surface on the cone, so the, not in the entire cone. Okay, so that's that's actually pretty well uh, described on this picture here from the, from the book, and uh, that particular that particular angle is uh, is important because that's going to they're all going to have the same projection on the normal 
to the to to, to the to the direction of of of, uh, of uh, to, to, towards the surface area. Okay. So if you look at the geometry of this, the the the, the angle is two pi sine theta d uh, theta, and uh, remember that the maximum number, the maximum uh, angle that I can get, the maximum solid angle I can get is four pi. So if you did on the previous slide, right? So that means that the the number of particles that are in this little uh, opening there that's in, in that's shown on the on on the figure. Uh, is is of course the total the solid angle divided by four pi. Okay, so this is the fraction of particle that that are in this little piece of 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 space. Okay, so that's that's important. So these are all the particles that will have the same projection on the direction perpendicular to the surface area. Okay, and so we find that in that case. Uh, the omega over four pi will be, of course, one half sine theta d theta for geometrical reason uh, from the right hand side. This is the most complicated slide of the entire derivation, by the way. So take your time to stop and think about how you get from one step to the next. Uh, OK, now we can go one step further. We can calculate the number of particles. So d omega over four pi is the ratio of particle correspond to all the particle, but we already know all the particle that go at the velocity V between V and V plus dV. This is what we did on two slides ago using a Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. And those particles that we studied before was N, the density of particle, times FV dV, which is the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. So by multiplying by one half sine theta d theta, we get the total number of particle that have a velocity between v and v plus dv times, uh, but I also have an angle between theta and theta plus d theta. So that's really nice. That's really nice. Okay. That's the, that's that's almost there because now what we need to know, uh, we, we we have this particle. Now what we need to know is how many particle will actually hit the wall in a given time dt. Because remember, what we are interested in is a change in momentum. That's what gives the force, right? Remember uh, your introductory physics course. So we need to find how many particles will hit the wall in a given amount of time. Okay? So we need to do that, and then we will almost be there. So let's try to do this next step. How many particles will hit the wall during uh, time d, uh, dt? So again, all the particles that will hit the wall uh, at a given time dt will depend on the velocity, of course. So if, and, and the idea is that all the particles that will be in a certain volume with uh, which, which a base uh, a square, right? Uh, I mean, a, sorry, a, uh, a to the power one half squ square, so a. So this is, this is the base of the volume that we, that's, that we don't see. It's, it's actually a, a perpendicular to the to this screen. To the screen. And then all the particle that will hit the wall, uh, all the particle that is velocity v that will hit the wall during a time dt will do will be those who belong to that volume uh, v dt a. Okay, okay. And of course we have to take into account that not all the particle go uh, perpendicular to the wall. In fact, uh, you have, most of them will not go perpendicular to the wall. But what matters is that the, the, the volume, so the, basically the volume that corresponds to the, all the particles that will hit the wall at time dt will be av dt cos theta. And cos theta comes from the fact that v is not uh, normal to the wall. Okay? There will be some that are normal, of course. There will be some that, that most of them won't be. So these are the total number of particles that will hit the wall uh, during time dt. Okay, so that's very nice because we're almost there. Now we calculate we, we, we those total number of particles, multiply by those particles, okay, the particles that are that have actually is velocity v, and of course multiply, uh, we only want those that have a component, uh, that have all the same com component uh, with respect to the normal because we need that to calculate the actual pressure, which corresponds only to the force that's perpendicular to the wall. So in other words, we're almost almost there, really. <laughs> we have 
this, uh, this equation that start to, to be interesting. So I put some colors there to show you what we had just added. And uh, now what we want to do is to uh, calculate the number of particles. And so what I did in the last, the last part is uh, divide by A dt. Why? Because I have to divide by A to get the pressure and I have to divide by dt because uh, we want the force, right? The, fo the force will be the momentum, the variation of momentum with respect to time, and then we'll divide by the surface area. Okay, so that's really nice. We are almost there, almost there. One more step. The most, one more step is to realize that each particle is going to uh, provide a momentum to mv cos, cos theta, okay? Uh, so this is, this is what we have. Uh, we, we have a, a change in momentum of uh, two, 2 mv cos theta. So each of the particle we just calculated that we hit the wall with, with a surface area A during a time dt, each of them will impart a momentum change of 2 mv uh, cos uh, theta, okay? So all we have to do is to, is to multiply the number of particles that have the right properties uh, by, by this term. So mathematically, it's much easier to see this is exactly what I, I had. Uh, uh, so basically, if I use the colors here, this is the momentum transfer, okay? And here, this is the number of molecules that are hitting the surface during the time dt. That's what we did in the previous slide. So all we have to do now to get the pressure, and, and the pressure again is divided as the force divided by surface area, and with the force divide, defined as the derivative of the momentum perpendicular to the wall uh, with respect to time. All we need to do is to integrate this. So we integrate this over the velocity, and velocity, of course, can go from zero to infinity. And we have to uh, integrate all this uh, through the angle uh, going from zero to, to pi over two, okay? So this integral is actually not that complicated, it turns out. Um, it's, 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 these are uh, kind of elementary, uh, elementary integral. And uh, what we find is that, of course, the, the integral with theta is, 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 uh, is in fact, uh, fairly trivial. It's, it's a cos cube over three. And then uh, what, we, what we end up with is that we, we have to integrate, uh, we end up on the first part, the first integral is actually the expectation value of the square velocity, right? Uh, which we have calculated already, but we, we can just use it here. But we find that the pressure it's just one third nm v square, right? Uh, you don't have to go into tables to calculate this because the two integrals are, are elementary. Uh, um, for, actually, the first integral is just a definition of the expectation value of v square. Very nice. So we 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 are one step away from the, from proving the ideal gas law. Okay, so. For that, let's remember that the total number of molecules in the volume V is, we have defined it as, as, we will define it as uh, uppercase N. So of course, N is equal to small n times V, small n being the density that we have used so far. So I can use the equation from the previous slide and replace N, small n by large n divided by V. So I get, and I move V to the left-hand side, so I get PV equal one third NM V square. And this is where you have to remember what we did in the Maxwell Boltzmann equation, uh, where we, we did actually calculate the expectation value of V square, and we found it was three kBT over M. Yes, remember, this is actually fairly easy to remember this because we know that the expectation value of MV square over two is three kBT over two, right? Remember that this is, this is a fundamental property of, of uh, thermal energy. We, we've done that in the, in the, in the previous uh, screencast. So, if we substitute the expectation value of V square, uh, we end up with this equation here, which is PV equal NKBT, which is exactly the ideal gas law, okay? So that's, that's, that's pretty nice. And so this is where we find that, that, that uh, the approximation we made um, to get the ideal gas law is that uh, the particle do, do not interact with each other and there is only uh, there is only interaction through collisions, and and the only part of the energy is the, the kinetic energy, right? So we've seen this. It's, this is this is what what we found, and uh, so 
what, what's a, an, a thing that's very important to, to notice is that um, the ideal gas law does not depend on the mass of the particles. And this is, this is a bit surprising when you think about it, because the, the impulse, the total uh, momentum that you transfer to the wall through a collision should depend on the mass, right? It's mv. Uh, so why is the, the pressure depending on the mass? Well, it turns out, and it, we understand this very well now, it turns out that you have another uh, factor of m of mass that shows up in the uh, average kinetic energy. Okay, and it's it's written there. Uh, the, the, the expectation of value of v squared is depends on on m. Uh, so. Um, I mean, the expect there is another factor of m depending that comes across from uh, from the expectation value of v square. So basically, it's true that each particle that has a larger mass will transfer more impulse, but there are fewer of them. There are fewer fewer particle at a velocity v. So that's that's the reason why we see that the the, the pressure does not depend on the mass. Okay. So that, that's nice. Now, I'd like to say an additional word because uh, in practice problems, that's not always the equation. We use PV equal NKBT, uh, where N is the number of, of particles. Usually we, we work with the number of mole, especially when you do a, a chemistry lab. So the, one, the, 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 the formula that's usually used in chemistry is PV equal NRT, where N is the number of mole. And R is the gas constant. Of course, uh, R is simply uh, the Avogadro number multiplied by uh, the Boltzmann constant. And this is, this is, again, not very hard to see simply because the number of, of particle and the number of mole, they only di differ between each other by, a one, by the Avogadro number. Right? So this is, uh, this is actually all fairly, uh, fairly fundamental. So that's nice. Now, what we see, of course, is that uh, clearly there is a connection between pressure and kinetic energy. And uh, you can think about the kinetic energy as being one half mv square. And then you can calculate the density of kinetic energy uh, or the average kinetic energy, in fact. OK, so the average kinetic energy will be the kinetic energy. Um, the expectation of kinetic energy will be the, the kinetic energy times the, the the distribution so this is the integral that we we see there uh, the with the maxwell boltzmann equation and we find that this expectation this this density of kinetic energy is one half n m v square where n is uh, the molecule of gas per unit volume so the density the, the the kinetic energy the the particle density so we see from comparing this equation to the to the last one to one we found on the previous slide, we see that the pressure is actually directly proportional to the density of kinetic energy. So it's two thirds the kinetic energy. So that's that's quite nice. Now uh, I, if we have to say a word about the the, the units, of course, uh, it's because we use we use the the appropriate unit uh, with where the, where, the, where you is an energy per volume, right? And an energy per volume, of course, is a force per surface, right? Because a potential is a force per distance and uh, and the volume, of course, is a surface time distance. So U is really a force per surface area and the pressure is also a force per uh, surface area. So it's always nice to, to check uh, the unit, that your units are right. So that's that's also not super surprising because remember we we neglected all the interaction um, others and collisions. So of course there is basically no other terms to add since we only consider the kinetic energy. So before we we conclude this screencast, we we can see that we understand Dalton's law that you've seen in chemistry. Uh, we can understand it fairly easily now because uh, basically Dalton's law allows you to calculate the partial pressure, basically saying that, for example, in the atmosphere, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is due to the pressure of each molecules, each particles. Uh, and the idea is like this. The idea is that uh, in, in the formula that we've proven for ideal gas, 
we had n, which was the the density of of particle. The den the, and so it turns out we can write the density of gas as a sum of partial densities as n equals sum of i over n i, and therefore we can write the pressure. Uh, we we can uh, write the pressure as a sum of partial pressure. In other words, we can um, partition the pressure between the different uh, the different contribution. And this works, of course, because there is no interaction between the molecule, and then so we can we can see that it's that the pressure is linear uh, with respect to the density of particle. So this is this is called uh, this is interesting because uh, you can calculate uh, the pressure, uh, the partial pressure of each uh, molecule separately, and and that's nice because of course we know that the pressure uh, can be calculated. Using uh, just using the molar mass of each of each uh, of each uh, component of the gas. So an example of Dalton's law, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, but just to show you how it works. Uh, if we look at air, we, if we know the, the the composition of air, which is mostly nitrogen, some oxygen, some argon, and a, a tiny bit of, of carbon dioxide, uh, what we can calculate the partial pressure. And so the partial pressure will be uh, simply given uh, by applying the formula that we have uh, on the previous slide, where we calculate the density of, uh, so the, the number of, the density in terms of the number of particles that we have uh, for, each, for each system, okay, for each, uh, for, for, for each uh, component of the gas. And so when we do that, and this is something that you do in, in chemistry one, uh, you probably did in high school, uh, more than likely. You get that the the, the partial pressure of carbon and the carbon dioxide is is actually is very small. And uh, what's interesting is that it's much much smaller than 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 the pressure the, than the composition the the, the, the amount of, of of carbon dioxide by mass in air, right? So that that's all interesting. So what you can now from the formula that we derived today in this screencast, we clearly see where the partial pressure comes from. That's the idea. Uh, this is uh, an application, a direct application of thermodynamics. Uh, I, I think that we can move on from there and then get to the summary of this, of this screencast. So we, we spend essentially half an hour uh, uh, proving uh, the ideal gas law. And uh, this is an idea that came from Bernoulli that said that, uh, uh, who said that the pressure was actually due to those particles hitting the walls. And uh, the empirical formula P, PV equal uh, NKBT, so um, was empirical, but here we can prove that it was right and it only works if we can use uh, uh, particles that do not interact with each other. But this is really at the end of the day, uh, this mathematical proof is, is very interesting just as a, as a reminder of how things work in terms of, of working in three dimension and also the, the central importance of Maxwell Boltzmann equation. So I do uh, invite you to, to take your time and make sure that you derive, we can derive these equations. Uh, fundamentally, there is just a couple of, of, of principles from, from basic physics that we have to apply. And uh, as such, uh, it's, it's a good exercise to complete. Uh, thank you very much. This concludes our lecture six. Uh, we are going to, to skip uh, lecture seven, which is on uh, effusion uh, of gas. So I strongly recommend those who are interested uh, to uh, look into the Brundle and Brundle's book and uh, uh, read uh, and, 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 and read this part. And we will jump directly to uh, lecture eight and talk about collision in our next uh, screencast. Thank you very much.